Hi, I'm Ken Carlson, and you're about to watch a short cut of my film, The Heart of Nuba. While it doesn't tell you the whole story, my hope is that it'll make you aware of how terrible things are in Sudan right now, for the people in the Nuba Mountains, and those who are risking their lives to save others. This is a story of good and evil. On the one hand, you have a government that is deliberately bombing hospitals and villages in order to kill a specific race of people. Sudan's genocide is ongoing, devastating, and all too often ignored. On the other hand, there are people like my good friend, Dr. Tom Katina, and his staff at the Mother Mercy Hospital who are, in the face of this evil, quite heroic. As you'll see, they give everything of themselves. They are the best of us, and they show that even when we have every reason to despair, there's always hope. Eyes been destroyed. Corny's lacerated it. It's all disrupted. Shoot the moon? You see the light. You know, I've, I've chosen to live in Africa. It's the longest I've been in one place uh, since I was 18. When I always admired the doctors. Certain doctors were the guy that goes to a town, sets up practice, and stays there for 30, 40 years. I always thought that was the coolest thing. And I've always wanted that as, as a doctor. I like that idea of staying in one place and becoming part of the community. He's got shrapnel to the chest, to the face, to the eye, to his right hand, and it was several pieces of shrapnel. The main problem is the average person to take care of that first. You should, you should do okay. He's young, he's otherwise healthy. If you don't screw something up, you should be okay. The lives of people here matter as much as anywhere in the world. This piece of shrapnel was liver. A small piece of metal. Easily kill you. Everybody's life is, is valuable and uh, uh, we can't lose sight of that, or else we lose our humanity. George, okay, George. Yeah. All right. Now, hopefully it's not bad, we'll see. So this is a typical case here for the Antonov bomber. His nose is completely missing. It'll heal, you know, we have to wait for it to heal over, but to try to get the nose back, you know, something beyond what I can do. It was just, just the way the shrapnel was, the way he was. In the machine conduct, what a win. Teacher. Huh? Teacher. Teacher. He was teaching. He was teaching. As, as, you were going, he, as, he, was as he was getting down, the, the bomb hit you. Yeah. Were the children okay? All the children are okay. How many children were there? there uh, 75. 75. Yeah. Was the school destroyed? Yeah. Uh, do you want any light? I have to catch one. It doesn't make any sense. None of this stuff makes any sense. It's all completely pointless. All this stuff is ridiculous. <clears throat> all right. Well, this is clean and dress. That, that'll scur in eventually. Um, all the war wounded are in this book. Here's George's here. So George is number 1,348, war wounded. We started this back in June 2011, the first group that came in back from the very first day. 
So this is the chip for my camera. So I've got all the Antonov wounds and the civilians that were injured with the, the bombings and the uh, artillery shelling or whatever are on, are on this disc here. So this I hope to use at the, at the war crimes trial for Omar Bashir. Well, the president of, of Sudan is Omar Hassan al-Bashir, who's been in power since 1989, they had a coup. Allahu Akbar! And uh, he's an absolute dictator. He's a guy who's been indicted by the International Criminal Court for war crimes and crimes against humanity um, for what he did in Darfur. Sudan, once Africa's biggest country, has been in conflict for so many years. When South Sudan became independent, it was supposed to usher in a new period of peace and stability in the region. But now, Southern Kordofan. At its heart is the Nuba Mountains, where some 50 black African tribes have lived for thousands of years. Now there's fighting there once more in one of the most remote corners of a vast country. The Nuba Mountains, it's rich with minerals besides oil. The, the valleys of the Nuba Mountains are very fertile. And Omar al-Bashir wants that, but he doesn't want the people. Bashir thinks that black is an inferior race. So he doesn't care for the people. He cares what is underneath the people. The government has decided really to, to exterminate these people, I believe. The war is not just with the soldiers in the barracks. Um, Attacking civilians means they want to exterminate the population. They use a scorched earth policy. They burn the village down. They burn all the crops in the field. So you burn and you scarify the land. You send bombers at 20,000 feet. You bomb the place. You drive people off the land. So by bombarding civilian populations, by refusing any basic services, by having starvation, maybe they will all leave and this will be empty land and there will be no more problems here. The greatest way of making a group of people really angry is to treat them really badly. I am ready to die here in my, in my homeland here but I cannot run away. How will these children of mine going to, to survive? I do wear it a lot, but we cannot run and leave our patients. We cannot run and leave our land. I pray God protect the life of our innocent children to grow and give us the peace. The fighting broke out uh, June 6, 2011. After that, there's a lot of fighting relatively close to us in villages that were maybe an hour from here. So we were all requested by the bishop to leave and all the security bodies in the place told us we cannot protect you anymore. Because the way things looked, we weren't sure if, if we were gonna be overrun. We, we weren't sure what was gonna happen. The diocese says, there's one plane coming. If you want to stay, the choice is up to you. But we, we cannot guarantee you that we'll get you out of there. So all the expatriate staff, Kenyans, Ugandans, a couple of Americans were here, decided, look, we're out of here, and they, they, they left. So we were left, Dr. Tom, myself, and Sister Rosio, the three of us. I knew that if I left, some people would die. Not that I'm a magician, but there are certain things I can do that someone will survive. Just, that's just a fact. So by leaving, that to me says that my life is more important than other people's lives, which I didn't, which I don't agree with. You know, I just I think it's wrong. I think it's wrong thinking. So let me let me stick it out with these guys. Even if, if we got shelled and whatever, uh, let's see what we can do. This is a minute with these. A minute. I'm all in. Okay. All right. This is Martha, she's 20, 22. She was at the place where they bombed on Thursday. It would be a long shot to try to salvage the arm. I think she'll have an amputation. Just give her some time. 
keep in mind that any airplane overhead is going to bomb and kill and maim somewhere. There are no commercial flights. There's nobody flying a Cessna overhead on a, you know, learning how to fly an airplane. Yes, passing over there. And this one drops barrel bombs. That's the antenna. So they know when they fly overhead, they're frightening people, they're scaring people. All of us are tuned into the sounds. And every time we hear a car, at first, everybody has been here for a while. If you pause for a second, you listen. Is that a car or is it the Antonov bomber? And your, your brain figures out it's a car because the pitch is different, then you relax a bit. If it's a bomber, you kind of keep listening. The, the wind sounds like the jet. So you wait a second. Is that the jet or is it the wind? You imagine what effects this has on this generation of children. When their life is, they hear an airplane overhead, they jump into a foxhole. My number one concern is that the hospital will be bombed someday. That at some point Bashir will just send some jets in and destroy it. He could kill everybody easily with those supersonic jets. This is the theater of absurdity we've entered, this conflict. This is Omar Hassan al-Bashir's Theater of the Absurd. You know, Lima Mountains is one of the few pockets left in the world where there's endemic leprosy. So we have quite a few patients still up there, both adults and children, up in TB Leprosy Village. There are a lot of myths with leprosy that's gone back. I mean, it's in Leviticus, it's in the Bible. Moses gave the law, they have to be cast out of the village, live by themselves, they have to announce themselves and they come ring a bell. I mean, it was terrible. So leprosy attacks the nerves, causes extensive nerve damage. So look at his hands. Uh, the hands, he's got wasting of the muscles in the hand because all the nerve impulses to that hand are gone. That's called a claw hand. They're just shorter, they become short because the nerve impulse is not there. It just reduces in size automatically. It's all finger resorption. I'm, I'm kidding. He's got some function, but he's lost a lot of function in his hand. This hand is much better shape. I mean, the truth is, it is contagious, but it is not highly contagious. Leprosy is spread by the same way as tuberculosis. They're both mycobacteria and they're spread by respiratory droplets. Both diseases, really, you need to be in close contact with somebody for a significant amount of time to get it. So by touching the, touching these guys and by touching the hands and, and touching the, the skin lesions, you can't get infected that way. Even if they cough on you, I mean, you have to, it takes a long time to get infected with it. You got a patch here in his face. We got him early. We started treating him early in the course, and we can most likely avoid any nerve damage to his hands. It's very important to touch these people. You know, in the West, we're taught almost a standoffish behavior with the patients. Like, the doctor-patient relationship is very formal. But I think the joke with the patients to, to touch them, I think is extremely important. These are people that have been rejected by society. They watch their bodies disintegrating. <laughs> if you can come and, and touch them, shake their hands, pat them on the back, joke with them, you know, put them in a, in a full Nelson and, you know, rustle them around a bit. They're a part of the human race, like anybody else. When I was first uh, in medical school, I, I was afraid of children. I was terrified of pediatrics. <laughs> Finally, I got comfort with them. And now I can't imagine uh, working here without the pediatrics part being part of what I'm doing. It's, it's sometimes the only thing that keeps me, keeps me sane and keeps me going. Shot wound to the leg, open fracture, 
didn't heal. And so we're trying to fix the plates and screws. It's a very high femur fracture, so really it's gonna be hard to have this thing to stick. You know, I promise you, you're not an expert in anything. I mean, an orthopedic surgeon, this wouldn't take this long. You just know what to do. Like, you go from this to a pediatric hernia to a whatever, I mean, it takes longer. So, yep, Jack Paul Trades, master of some. Even some of the stuff here is improvised. So I learned uh, most of the surgery on the job. I was in Kenya for eight years, working with a lot of different surgeons and did over 2,000 operations there. This one I had to learn from, from books and how to, how to do it. Shit. This one grabs the phone better. Yeah, yeah it went very well. We'll have to wait and see. No spike in the ball, we finish the case. Here. It's an antenna overhead. Who knows where it's going? Let's see, make a circle around. If it gets a bit louder, then people will head for the box holes. Make more of a dash for it. Hey, hi everybody, uh, greetings from the bush. This is Dr. Tom Katina, and I wanna thank all of you for watching The Heart of Nuba. For the past five and a half years, my team and I have logged every war-related casualty and injury which has arrived here at the Mother Mercy Hospital in the Nuba Mountains of Sudan. These numbers, however, only tell a fraction of the story. Not included are the tens of thousands of internally displaced by the fighting in Khartoum's scorched earth tactics. It is our hope that this movie will give a voice to the voiceless and shed some light on the plight of Anuba in this forgotten corner of the world. Let the dead and the maimed have their day in court and add your name to the witness list. Please take time and reflect on what you've seen and what you can do about it. Know that the killing did not stop when Ken turned his camera off. The aerial bombardments and the ground attacks on civilians have continued. The harvest from this past rainy season was very poor and there's absolutely nothing to buy in the market. Humanitarian access has again been denied by the Khartoum government, and we are looking at a very bleak year ahead. Please help us by urging your elected officials to find a resolution to this conflict and a resolution to the humanitarian crisis here in Nuba. We'll continue to push ahead with the work regardless of the situation around us. God bless you, and thank you for listening. <laughs>